Crooked Gap Farm friends, we've got a problem. A serious problem. But before we get to the problem, two things. First of all, we need to go start the 4010 because we're gonna need to use the tractor to solve this problem. And secondly, if you don't mind, if you like this video, if you like what we're putting out on the channel, give it a thumbs up, a subscribe, hit the notification bell, whatever it is that you do. We're starting to see some growth in the channel. I'm just really thankful for everybody that's watching and everybody that's taking time to subscribe and notify and you know all that stuff. I don't know if you can hear that, but that's the tank heater running on the 4010. When I woke up this morning, it was 18 degrees, I think. It's a little warmer than that right now, but it's still below freezing. So I plugged the tractor in because I knew we were gonna need it today. Now we're gonna start it up and let it warm up. Here's the problem we have. It is below freezing. It's gonna be below freezing at least overnight, all week long, and that's how much firewood we have. I actually have quite a bit of firewood cut out in the pasture. I just need to bring it up to the splitter and start splitting it. So let's hop on the 4010, load up the bucket, bring it to the splitter, dump it out, split, load, process, repeat. <coughs> Hello, Jack. <coughs> it's nice to hear from you. Have you guys met Jack yet? Jack is our almost 12 year old Great Pyrenees. He is a tired puppy. He sleeps most of the day, he sleeps most of the night. He can't really hear anymore, but we really love Jack. Good boy. There is roughly an hour's worth of work. Now, I did have all of those logs cut into size before I split them. Honestly, this is like a week's worth of wood if it stays as cold as it's going to be this week. Gives you an idea of how much work goes into heating your house with wood though. And it is a decision that you have to make when you are starting your farm. If you're gonna heat with wood, there's a lot of time that goes with it. Of course, there's money savings, also a lot of time though. Let's go find something else to do productive. Maybe you saw in the last video that I bought that air compressor and I've been selling a lot of stuff in order to do this shed project and fill the shed with tools that we need by getting rid of things we don't need. That air compressor spent most of the money that I had been saving by selling things. I need to find something else to sell and a couple weeks ago I realized that the most profitable thing that I have to sell on the farm right now is actually some Dexter heifers. We have too many Dexter heifers and we can sell those, those are our cows. What we need to do in order to sell the cows is we need to put up a fence in the winter lot, which we need to do anyways to get ready for winter, so that we can bring them up and work them with the vet. If anything's bred, we do have some yearling heifers. We can let people know that when we sell them. I'm gonna get a few extra fence posts. I'm gonna grab this. I'll tell you about this in a little bit. We're gonna start. Can't live with me, can't live without me. We're gonna start putting in some posts so that maybe tomorrow we can put some wire up. Let's load some fence posts. I'm gonna show you the awesome way that we put in posts around here. But before we get started on that, let me tell you what's going on and explain to you why it's going on. A couple years back, we had some damage done by the county. They've got this whole like mower on a claw thing. It's pretty crazy. And I was watching from the shed over there in the middle of a massive rainstorm. And the guy could not see his mower deal and it got up here into my fence and was like lifting the fence up in the air. In the process of doing that, he broke this post right here. Now I'm not overly mad about that because this fence has a lot of problems anyways. When I put it up, I thought I could get away without proper corner bracing. I was completely wrong. All my corner posts are bent in. This fence just has to go. And because it needs to go, I just want to do it right. And this time, instead of electric fence in this area, what I want to do is put in a woven wire fence that will be a physical barrier. And then in front of that, I want to have some electric that will be a psychological barrier so I can not only use this for livestock in the winter but I can also use it as a training pen for sheep or cattle or even pigs. The problem is I'm not going to get that done this year. My temporary solution is going to be pretty lame and easy. I'm going to put in some T-posts. I'm going to run four, maybe five wires. I won't have that physical barrier on the back side of it but I also won't have to worry about this mess that is this falling down fence. The most common way of putting in T-posts is like this. Post pounder, T-post. You just stand here and pound it until it's in deep enough. Well, I hop on my old green mare, watch how she runs. She don't like the old hoop snake, stomp until... If you do a lot of posts like that, you're going to get a workout. It's not as fun, though. So let me show you the way 
I do it 99% of the time. Step one is figure out where you're gonna put your post. Step two is to start your post. Take your T-post and your post driver. Give it a couple good pounds. Step number three involves this little contraption here. This is a two inch piece of metal conduit with a T fitting on top because when I went to the store a few years back, they didn't have a cap. Take this little contraption, slide it on top of the post, then hop in the tractor and let the loader do the work. Finally, you just come back over, take off your little guide. I will admit that when I am working by myself, it probably takes just as long to do it this way. But when there's a couple of us out here, it goes a lot quicker. And regardless, by myself or with someone else, it's a lot less taxing. And so I can get a lot more posts done in a day. What I'm gonna do now, I think, is come along. I've got all those toolboxes in the shed full of little corner insulators. I think I'm gonna go around to each one of these posts. Then I'll just attach each one of these little corner things. Honestly, all this stuff in here, and I've got one little baggie of the thing that I'm looking for. I'm horrible at this lean farming thing. I guess what I want to do is just start taking stuff back into the shed. Starting to bring stuff in from that backside that I know has a spot or that I can make a spot for. I'm going to start with this corner right here. This section is going to be our workshop area. Along the side here, we're going to have the blacksmithing shop, workbench, and hopefully tons and tons of shelves. In the entire life of this shed, all 24 feet wide of it by 48 foot long of it, this right here is the only shelf that we have ever had. This five shelf Rubbermaid thing. Let's just call it that. And I pulled it out thinking, I'm gonna start using this shelf and I got it out here. I don't wanna use this shelf. So can we design this live and on air right now? Can we design what this is gonna look like? Let me show you what I've got in mind. This is where the blacksmith shop is going to be. We might tweak a little bit where the setup is and how we do it. We're gonna try to have it take up as little room as possible. We're gonna need to install this wall back here, insulate it, side it, so that then we can start putting shelves up. Same thing as we go around the corner into this area right here this whole little area I suppose it's probably eight by eight that's kind of what I see as the blacksmithing shop that leaves us really only 16 feet from the blacksmithing shop area to the end of the building plus we've got a water hydrant right there all of this lumber right here this was a good place to stack it for a while but now that we have cement down and we're turning in this to an actual shop it's going to have to go somewhere up high what I'm thinking is up high we're going to have some racks you're gonna have to be able to use a ladder or a loader to go up and get it off of there but I'm okay with that because I really need my wall space down in front of it what I would like to have is a workbench from post to post up above that workbench I want to have shelves lots of shelves they come out at least two feet same thing as I go along here above this hydrant shelves that go up to the top that way we can pile in as much stuff as we can same thing right here in this section this is where a tractor or a piece of equipment is gonna have to park so I can't put any shelves shelves up there but there's a small section from here to right here where there's going to be a door to go into the lean-to to this post right here where I can put more shelving so from here to here I'm thinking two foot shelves from the ground all the way up to here and then above the door we're gonna go shelves all the way to the ceiling now don't get the wrong idea I am still getting rid of a lot of stuff but there is important stuff that we only use once or twice a year probably the easiest example to think of right now is all the 4-h livestock equipment so if we could store that up way high in totes that we only have to bring down when we're ready to use it that would be a huge benefit it's not keeping too much we're still using lean systems but it's something we need I just had a thought. I said we're doing this live on air. Instead of shelves right above this workbench, we're gonna have a pegboard to hang tools. That leaves not a lot of extra space for all the other stuff that needs to go into the shed, but since we're thinking live on air right now, let's talk about one more space. This is an area where I said we're gonna have a temporary slash permanent wall that comes out to here, a garage door that goes behind me, and then a garage door that goes right here. If we do have a semi-permanent wall here, this is a place where I see hanging a lot of tools. Shovels and fencing tools, things like that, farm tools that I need, especially from here up to where the grinder mixer is. There's a good 12 feet here that I can use if we have stuff that line up flat against the wall. Of course, this is just spitballing. So if you've got any ideas on how I can lay this out to make it as efficient as possible, because honestly, we have to make use of the space as best as we can. There's just not a lot of space here. I would love it. Put your comments 
below. I need all the help I can get. Oh yeah, and I'm getting rid of these shelves. They're not gonna work. I don't even want to use them temporary. I just want to get the right thing and move on. They're gonna go out in my line of stuff for sale. My hodgepodge sales have kind of tanked a little bit. Get the pun there. I've had a little interest in that tank, but nobody's come and picked it up yet. Nobody's really asked about this brooder. Hopefully these rims can get taken pretty soon. Same with that single hog feeder. Somebody should want that. That shelf, it's free. I'm trying though. I'm really, really trying, but I think the cows selling those heifers, that's gonna be the next big sale. Before we end the video today, I thought I would show you something fun. Every Monday night, we've been coming to robotics for quite some time now. And so I thought I would bring you in, show you the robot that the team has been working on. There's a lot of work yet to do, but they've been been doing a good job. Let's see what it's doing now. If you're not familiar with First Tech Challenge, that's what this is all about. They've been doing a lot of cardboard prototyping, shooter prototyping. There is a challenge that they have to be able to do and they have to create a robot that can do that challenge. Every Monday night for three hours or so, we come here and work on the Taco Botics robot. That's our team's name. It's kind of crazy. I will just admit that. It is kind of crazy. It's something different than the farm, but it's a lot of fun. Thank you all so much for watching. Have a great day. I'm gonna go play with the robot.